What's up, investor? Now to, on today's podcast, we're going to be talking to a Canadian investor that is going to answer the question on how can Canadians or folks outside the United States invest in the United States. Now we're going to be going into just some investing and entity structuring ideas, and we're not advocating for any of this type of stuff, but. It gives a good insight into what it takes for some other folks that we have to have some international investors in the group, what they have to go through. And it might also expand your mind to thinking to get in outside of the United States. And this is the typical topic material that a lot of high net worth investors, when your net worth goes over three, four, five million dollars, a lot of people, they might have a lot of distrust in the United States government or just want to diversify over the United States. Now, I personally believe that the United States is the best nation out there because we have the best military, but it might be prudent to get outside of the United States for other reasons like taxes or maybe just having another passport to be able to get out of town. If you're in the United States and you love the United States, today's podcast probably isn't going to be too much value for today. But before you go, I just wanted to go over a couple of thoughts or lessons I'd like to share with you guys before you guys take off to the podcast. Now, somebody introduced to me this idea of an, an incubator group out there. And this is really not in the world of real estate, but in the more of the world of venture capital. And I've spent a couple of years, I spent a lot of my time looking into venture capital because here we have all these investors and looking for ways to grow their money, which ultimately just ended up me coming back to real estate, mainly for the taxes and the stability, and especially when you go into stabilize apartments or stabilize properties that it's already occupied and it's more of a cash flow model. Really, you're very conservative in your investment and you can really sleep at night where venture capital projects, very asymmetric type of returns where you might hit it big the 5% of the time. Sure, maybe the overall return when you average in all the losers might be a little bit higher than real estate. But personally, that's just not the way I'd like to invest. I'd rather hit a high percentage of singles and doubles and also get the tax benefits from it, which you don't get from all these other asset classes. But somebody brought, brought me for one of these uh, incubator groups. And what I've learned, and I could be wrong because this is outside of the realm of real estate, was there's a lot of these incubator groups put forth by these influencers. You can call them mini gurus if you want. But a lot of these guys, they just couldn't hack it as venture capitalists actually doing the thing. And as the saying goes, those who can't do teach. So in this world, those who can't make freaking companies, what they do is they'll create these incubator programs where they get a bunch of other mini startups and they give them the resources, they give them some general education, coaching, mentoring, and they create this kind of greatly branded and marketing incubator where they will go out and possibly raise capital from them. And it gives some legitimacy to the venture capitalists. But really, this is all just a fabricated business model for the group creator to extract money from these dime a dozen venture capitalists to join their incubator group and also to make possibly make money on the fact that they have this group and some unsuspecting high net worth ultra high net worth person coming along just thinking that the group is legit when it's just not it's just put on by somebody who couldn't do their thing and they're pretty good at internet marketing so just be on the where that's out there. I ran into a lot of folks like that. And then the kind of the second teaching today is I think we're in a very unusual time. We're in a bull market, folks, if you haven't realized. And if you think that the market is going to be like cooling off any times, I would disagree. A lot of the stuff I'm reading is we're really not going to hit any rocky times until the year 2026. Now, you may disagree with that. You, you're probably going to miss out on the best bull market run that you ever did see even more than the time 2012 to 2016, which was known as the age of the apartment. Now is the good market, it's a bull market, the tide is coming in, and it's potentially not a good time to be doing more of a duck and cover strategy or what I've called, called a strategy, a part of the end game strategy. When you have a lot of money, you just wanna get a little yield. One of those strategies in particular is the triple nets, right? When you go into a commercial real estate property, and your tenant pays off all the expenses for you. It's lower risk, 
lower return, but it may not be the best thing in this type of environment. Right now, with inflation running rampant, a lot of your tenants, which on the you know, the marketing cereal box, they tell you triple net deals, you have, you know, corporate back, very strong tenants, but that can also have a double edge because the very sophisticated tenants, they know what's happening in inflation and they can just tell you to go screw off when it's time to, they can drop their lease or they're a lot more aggressive and they're a lot more sophisticated in terms of negotiating with you, the landlord in the triple net deal or the triple net arrangement that you have with them. Think of it like a lot of mom and pop investors got kind of rocked with in the pandemic because they weren't able to fully capitalize on the rents going up and they bent over just giving away rent concessions to the tenants, thinking that, yeah, it made sense in the pandemic, but the professional landlords, the kind of the way we do, we're not hugely impacted by rent moratoriums and eviction moratoriums and we know how to play our vendors know how to play the game to extract the whole amount of rent that is due and that rents are going up over time and that's just something that the mom and pop that's just the, the amateurs just don't have the ability to do and that's just making the comparison with triple netflix too and you combine that with the fact that like walgreens these types of stores are closing possibly because of amazon coming and taking over the pharmacy sector too. And again, I'm just bringing up this concept. You may agree, disagree, but it might be a time to be more aggressive in times of a bull market and when you should be aggressive and huddle and duck and cover into these more conservative triple net type of arrangements that are traditionally lower return, lower risk. And just be cognizant of what other large families are doing. Large families, what they do is they go into those asymmetric risk plays with a certain amount of their net worth while also playing it safe. You know, I don't, I'm not saying that you have to have the same strategy within your entire portfolio or another idea would be to be bipolar with your portfolio, potentially being very risk tolerant with a smaller portion going after more asymmetric risk returns and maybe being more conservative with a majority or a portion or maybe even a minority of your portfolio if you're in the beginning wealth building stages under $5 million net worth and to go into deals that are more conservative with that portion of your portfolio. Now, everybody's different. And this is where I talk to a lot of new investors. We have our onboarding call, which you guys can still do if you sign up at simplepassivecashflow.com slash club. We only do one per person these days for people. After that, you've got to join the family office on a mastermind, get around other folks just like yourself doing this and start to build relationships with other high net worth family. If you've been around the circuit, dumpster dive in the free Facebook groups, the free online forums, and even worse, the free meetup groups out there with a bunch of house flippers and lower net worth guys, just join the family office on a mastermind, right? You, you got to get to a point where you pay to play. And that's what I personally did in 2015 when I had 11 rentals and I saw the light and I got around other high net worth folks. And I realized that was the, what you do to get your net worth up to be about a quarter million, half a million dollars. But when you become over an credit investor, it's about investing in good deals where you get the tax benefits. You start to learn how to play the game of passive activity losses. You pay less taxes. You do a little bit of infinite banking. And that's the way that the passive accredited investor invests. And unless you get around a community, like our family office on a mastermind, you do not get that. To apply, go to simplepassivecashflow.com slash journey and hope to see you out at a future event. We're doing a meetup in San Francisco and we're also going to be doing a tour in Houston, but you guys can check out all future events at simplepassivecashflow.com slash events. All right, here's the show. This is a story about a dude named Lane. Then one day he went and tried to rent them out, and then he became one of the best of man. Hey, Simple Passive Cashflow listeners. Today, we are going to be talking about investing from a different country, and in this case, Canada. So we got one of our experienced investors here. I'll do the disclaimer right now. We're not lawyers. We're not CPAs, not accountants. We're just a couple of guys who are real investors and use professional advice from our professional advisors. And this is how we do it. Not saying it's right or wrong, but hopefully it's just to give you some ideas as this podcast is just for your entertainment out there. But uh, thanks for coming on, Quentin. Appreciate it. 
Oh, no problem, Lane. Give people a quick overview at some of your wide range of experience. I think people need to understand that you're quite a big dog there at Canada. Thanks, man. I hang out with big dogs, so I feel like a small dog with them. But I've been investing since 2004. By the end of August, I'll have $80 million of assets under management. The uh, smallest amount of equity I own in any project is 25%, and that's about 30% of my real estate portfolio is 25% like personally owned by me, not shared. And the other 75%, I own 50 to 100% of. So I've got a large stake in, in my portfolio. I have single family homes, up to 40 unit uh, apartment buildings. We'll have 15 apartment buildings across Southern Ontario. I do invest in the US and uh, got some reasons for that. I'm sure we'll talk more about. I've written five books. I run a real estate investment club in Ontario, which is a Durham REI. I was a teacher for a long time and I left teaching to be a full-time investor in 2014. And I haven't looked back since. I flipped like a dozen houses. I've done a whole bunch of other strategies. And, you know, I, I really love investing in real estate, not for the fact that it's investing. I just like being a transaction engineer. Like I like putting things together, making deals happen, uh, refinancing projects. I, lo I love all that sort of stuff. And uh, I understand the asset class. And, and that's why I, when I look to wh what I consider diversification is moving money outside of the area of where I mostly control, which is Southern Ontario, and look at the U.S. as a way to expand that. So it's Quentin's pretty experienced, that's for sure. And on this show, I have a loose policy where it's a, no gurus. Quentin fits in that category. We're going to try and bring some real value, which is like, how do we invest in Canada? And I was really interested in investing outside of the country at, at one time. And we're going to talk a little bit about that. But just to your main business, you're an operator in Canada, more, more importantly, more on the eastern side of Ontario. Maybe yeah. describe your portfolio, like just percentage, like what percent in Canada and then versus uh, United States and anywhere else. Just to give people like a real quick macro view. I would say that I've got a, all my, like I've got a, like an $80 million portfolio just in Southern Ontario. And I would say that, 75% is in multifamily. The other 25% would be like in one to four unit properties. In the US, I, I don't have very much. I got a, probably about a million invested in the about maybe 550K worth in like I've got four single families in, in Tampa or five single families. One One's a duplex. Actually, I, I got to go back and look. I can't remember. But, and then I've got... You haven't even visited it? I, I've been there. Okay. I've, I've been to the... Like when I went down, I went... I've been down to uh, Tampa a couple times. I actually like to visit the places that I invest in. So I, I was there and I looked at the properties that I purchased, at least the first two. And then, you know, I've, I've been doing uh, syndications in the U.S., I have invested in an ATM fund down there. I do other things too. I've invested, I'm like on the board of directors for a company uh, called Rentaf, which is they basically do bank account checks for tenancies and stuff like that. I've got private placements. I've invested in different companies too. So I've got my, I've got funds in different places, but on the real estate side, I would say like about a million down in the U.S. as a hedge. Like I, I understand real estate and that's why I want to continue to invest. And I like the fact that I get uh, to invest in an asset class I understand with other operators down there. And what I like is that I'm not depending on the Canadian economy now. I'm looking at the uh, U.S. economy and different demographics in different areas as well. I'm getting paid in U.S. dollars, so I get some currency hedge there which is uh, useful for, I think that's really like great for myself. And also like everywhere we go, when we go on vacation, we spend US dollars. That's what we, like I go to Costa Rica, I'm spending US dollars. I go to wherever. And so it's handy to be able to have those US dollars already converted for me. And having the proper structure is really important because you can get slammed, especially a Canadian investing in the US with double taxation. That's, that's the worst. It's two hands coming into your pocket at the same time, taking your money and pulling it out and don't want to do that. Having the structure is important and taking the time to get it right. 
to avoid doing that. But I've, I've enjoyed everything I've done up to this point. And my experiences, I've had some experiences with property management in the U.S. Like it's like with, with the rental properties that I've had and having to deal with that. But I think overall, my experience has been really good. And I've, like, I've really benefited from real estate over the last, I don't know, two decades. I'm, I'm really happy with, with doing it and I'm continuing to do it, right? Yeah. And so I'd like to point out for the folks like in this lens of diversification, right? Like Quentin and kind of myself, we're considered operators, which you guys are not. You guys listening are mostly passive investors. And I, I, I think of operating, we're, we're, we eat our own cooking. We're going to be heavily into our product. For Quentin, that's going to be up in Ontario. For me, that's going to be apartments that I run. I personally feel like I'm in like 80% of my own stuff. And it seems like the same thing for Quentin, very heavily that side the analogy I, I or the the similarity i see it with like people who used to live back in the day where they buy their own company stock that they work for we all know that's dumb but people used to do that pretty religiously um, until things like enron started to happen and woke people up but that's what we do so people always ask me like what should i do how should i diversify my portfolio and that's the first question are you an operator or are you just a passive investor if you're a passive investor you're more likely to diversify a lot, but I personally came to this epiphany where I was like going into a lot of deals by myself. I got a lot of my own equity in there. I probably want to have this loose idea of having 20% of deals where I'm not the operator and a totally different asset class, not apartments as just being prudent. And I don't know, maybe Quinta, what do you, how did, did you come with the same thought process too? Is that what kind of led you to come into America? One of the things that I've looked at over the, over time is that Robert Kiyosaki's where you have employee, self-employed, business owner, investor. And so for me, I'm trying to focus on that right side. In, in Canada, I'm the business owner. In the U.S., I'm the That's the way that I see myself. And by, by doing that, I'm able to use my experience in the asset class as a way to get involved in different projects down there. I'm also learning how to do the stuff, right? Like it's also part of, me. I enjoy learning all the time, but I'm able to see what the projects are like. And then I can look at different projects and invest in different projects that, that I want to. And yes, I can diversify across different projects but at the same time like my concern is that I'm not a big enough player in a particular project in order to affect change in that project whereas here I'm an operator if something needs to change I'm going to make it happen that's my role that's my I, I I, I make things happen. I make no's into yeses, right? In a project where I'm a small player, I, I don't have the ability to do that. So when you have an operator that's also an investor in a project, it makes it a little bit more comfortable for that person because then that you have a, quite a few people together that are brought together and then they have a little bit more control, a little bit more control than most, like you're explaining before your analogy there, but that, that gives some comfort and it gives you some diversity because then you can be in different, like different projects in areas that you like. Maybe it's Arizona, maybe it's Texas, maybe it's Alabama, wherever it is that gives you still that the geographic diversity. But for me, like I'm getting into being the more of the investor side of things rather than the business owner side of things. Yeah, it, it's you're used to driving your car and your family around all the time. It's nice to get into an Uber once in a while and just relax and play with your phone and enjoy the scenery outside. But for some people, it's very difficult to turn that turn it off oh yeah my, my son just started driving so now i'm in the passenger seat and I, i'm not it's not like being in an uber i'm like ah. you're conscious to what the heck is happening the nuances that are going on behind the scenes when a certain message comes out but then i don't know i i do this i kind of enjoy it like the little i fit in deals and we'll talk about this at the end i've been in deals as a passive that haven't gone as smoothly and things have blown up and I'm just, I, I find it as entertaining being on the other side to just being a, a, a passive investor on that. But let's, um, before we move on, let's talk about the, some similarities or differences with Canada and US since you see both sides. 
any quick things that come off to the top of your head just, just for investors out there, just for a general broad understanding of differences between the Yeah, structures, the way that we buy stuff, like the syndication model is, is very similar. It, it's sometimes it, I, it's structured differently. So like when I'm putting together a bunch of people t together to buy a building in Ontario, if I have less than 10 people, I'm probably just going to use a corporate structure. We'll have a corporation and we'll have shares in the structure. If I, you know, more than 10 people, I'll probably do an LPGP structure which is pretty much the same as like the syndication model in the US. You have you have the SEC and you have the like the, the just a different different ways that it's set up, but big picture wise they're very similar. So from from the multifamily side, it's quite quite the same, just some nuances that are different. On the residential side, you get, you have this beautiful product in the US. It's called 30 year mortgage, 30 year term. Now, we don't have that. Like it's not, there's no, like the longest that you can get is a 10 year term. And I don't even think you'd want to have that. So, you know, you have this 30 year, your, your term at like a super low rate is really, uh, it's really awesome. And you've got some more, I would say, innovative products on the financing side, particularly in the one to four unit space. We don't have those sort of things, but what we do is on the financing side for the multifamily units, we do have the ability to go higher loan to value, which I, I don't think I've really seen in the U.S., but we have like CMHC financing that can get us up to 85% to 90% loan to value with still sub 2% rate, which is uh, pretty different. Now you'd have to, you'd probably, you'd know around the multifamily side, whether you, what you have on for financing in multifamily buildings. Yeah. So that's the, the lending is the big piece there. And so that probably means you guys don't cash flow a lot on a lot of the deals that just because the amortization is way short. No, the amortization can be like, you can get it up to 30, 30 year AMs. For the multifamily side, typically they're 25 year AMs on the multifamily, but if you're going to CMHC financing, the AM, AM rate will go up too. So it actually works out really well. On the like resi side, so one to four units, you're, you're like it's typical to get 30 year amortizations. And right now, resi rates are probably around, I would say, 2% too, probably depending on your qualification rate and, and all of those things. But it's, I would say it's around that. Cash flow wise, like I would compare like Toronto to like, like a New York or somewhere in California. And, and the landlord laws are like in California too. So it's, it's pretty nuts when it comes to that. It's tough. Like you get a lot of appreciation. So my, the way that I've been able to do really is I, I don't buy anything that doesn't cash flow uh, in my market and I make it work. And I, we work to, to do value add. We do, we turn over units. We do a lot of different things to make the, make it work and, and make it cash flow and, and then refinance and, and do it again and pay back the investors funds and continue to own it and that's why i like the syndication model in the u.s where we where we're doing exactly the same thing except i don't have to worry about financing if i try to get financing as a canadian in the u.s it sucks like it like i've i, I spent almost a year and a half getting financing for those rental properties in in tampa a year and a half it was brutal and just at the point where I was about to get financing, it was like March 2020. And then COVID, boom, they got rid of all the foreign national lending. So it was a real pain. So what, what's nice for me as a Canadian investing in the U.S. is I get to take advantage of leverage, which I wouldn't necessarily be able to do if I were to invest directly in the projects myself. Now, you would have asset-based lending for multifamily buildings in, in the U.S., but you still don't, as a foreign national, unless I partnered with somebody else who is a national in, in, in the U.S., I wouldn't be able to take advantage of it in the same way. So it's interesting that, that I'm able to take advantage of that through investing in syndications in the U.S., yeah. And just as a side note, the key principles, the loan guarantors in American syndication, when we go get that Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, I don't think you can be a foreign national. I've seen it done sometimes if you have like a green card, but then I've seen it happen sometimes, but it just takes an act of God and people are like lenders are just really confused when it does happen. But yeah, that's up for Americans. But I guess going back to your investing in Ontario, 
into a primary market. So are you focusing on like the more outskirts, the more rural areas of Ontario or? And I focus on the 401 corridor, which is from Toronto out to Kingston. There's, it's the major highway corridor there. And it's where a, a lot of the population in Canada is along that 401 corridor. I stick to the bigger cities and the bigger locations within there, but on the outskirts. So the suburbs of those, lo- of those. so I'm not in Toronto, but I'm in the outskirts of Toronto, but not in, not rural. So suburban, I would say. So Pickering, Ajax, Whitby, Oshawa, Kingston, and, and I'm, I, I work hard to buy properties directly from owners. When I buy all the buildings that I bought have never been listed on the MLS system. It's always, I always work directly. I have a good reputation. I, I like people know me. I, I do what I say I'm going to do. If I say I'm going to close, I'm going to close. And my reputation is a really important. So that's how I do a lot of the work that I do in, in Ontario. And I, and I'm, what I am hoping for is those same relationships through the people that I'm investing in the U.S. with. So they're like me in the U.S. And that's what I want one to uh, be able to do, to be able to invest in an asset class that I understand, be a little bit more hands off. But it's still I can read the numbers. I can see what's going on. I like, And I have no problem putting people's feet to the fire if I think something's a problem. (laughs) And I think what I like about our relationship is you understand what's going on. And as for some people, you know, you tell them something like we just had a a fire on one property and you tell unsophisticated investors, they freak out, right? Where you're going to ask the right question. All right. What's the deductible covered or the kind of anomalies? Like fine. I've had it. I had a total loss on a building. I've had to start from scratch. It took me two years to rebuild. Like I, I went through the whole process. I actually, what I did was a little bit different on that. I hired an independent adjuster so that they fought on my behalf for me against the adjuster of the insurance company in order to get me a, a little bit more. We do that every time too. And one time we did it, we got I think three times as much as the first offer. If you're on a little residential property, it may not be worth it. Because I had a rental property that I owned outright myself, and I just got steamrolled. I just it was the big, it wasn't big enough. Nobody would work, the, and I just got screwed over by the insurance company. But that's why the, the bigger stuff is better. But let's get into the question at the top. So, a Canadian wants to invest in America in a syndication. How do you structure it? Again, you're not a lawyer, but how do you? you do this yourself there there are a bunch of different ways to do it and you have to be careful because some of the advice that you see on the internet is like old and it doesn't work anymore like some of the things that you hear are like buying it as a canadian you you hear buying an llc if you buy in an llc as a canadian you're going to be double taxed the the canadian government that doesn't see that as an independent entity and you'll be double taxed on that. And if you earn a dollar and you get taxed 20 cents there and 30 cents here, what do you have left? Yeah. Why did you do it in the first place? It's important that you get a structure that avoids the double taxation. So the way that I do it in the U.S. is I use a limited partnership where the general partner is an LLC and the general partner owns 0.5% ownership of the LP and 99.5% is owned by the the limited partner. And that can be a corporation and that can be owned by a, a Canadian corporation or it could be owned personally. The idea is that when you are doing your taxes in the US, you're gonna try to take as many deductions as possible so that you get to a, a zero tax rate and you're not bringing anything back. And what, what's nice is that they have so many different, th- another difference is depreciation. Like your depreciation is super awesome in the U.S. And I can take the, some of that depreciation up front uh, because you can segregate it. You can, there's just so, so many more benefits. Like I can get zero every year and I've got, and I've got like backup from previous years because I'm able to, to do that. But with having that limited partnership and uh, doing my taxes in the U.S., when I take the, whatever I've finally made and bring it back to Canada, it's usually zero. And then that that way I'm not double taxed on that, on the income that I've made in the US. There are other ways to do it. There's S Corp. Let's recap the the first way. So I think some people, they get confused because we throw around the terminologies of LP and LP, right? Which is a different thing. L is a position within a larger deal, a limited partner, but there's also the entity LP, LP or the entity and LLC. So you're creating 
a Canadian LP, US LP? So I'm creating a US LP that has, so in every uh, US LP, this is the legal structure. There is a GP and an LP within that, right? The limited general partner and a limited partner within the limited partnership. So the general partner in this case owns is another structure that I own, which is a uh, 0.5%. It's an LLC, right? So I've got my LLC that owns 0.5% of the LP and then 99.5% of the LP can be owned by me. It's a limited partnership or it could be owned by a corporation. It could be a U.S. corporation, like an S corp or whatever you, would you whatever you wanted to do it as. I, I, it can just, for me, it's just personal. Then, so that's one option for structuring. So right? it's, it's like you have control. You're, you're, the thing that you can enter through is your LP within this entity and you have control over it. it I think a lot of people do this in America where they have a, a family management company, a holding company where they own a piece of the LP. They have control over that. So that way, it's like a, it's like how it's kind of like an LP works in a syndication, but you're doing this all on your side. And so this entity goes into all these other deals. So I just want to break that out for folks because you know, they're thinking like, do you make an LP for every deal? No, this is all your entity. Show. That's right. It could be your, it's your base structure. And then that's what goes and invests in like these other projects or owns the property in, in the U.S., right? In, in Canada, what you're talking about would be like a family trust, right? Like it would be like that type of arrangement, but with within a bunch of other structures. But for in the U.S., the way that I have it is that I know other people that have done it differently, right? There, there's the right... Like I stay out of the gray area, okay? I'm not into it for to, to hide my money somewhere or to avoid taxes. I, I, I'm okay with paying the, my fair share of taxes, whatever. But there are other ways to do it that I've heard that people do that are Canadians who are investing in the US. Yeah, yeah. So this is like me personally, I'm not a lawyer, but I'm not a huge fan of series L. People use them, but these are like the sim similar things that other people do and just we're just talking about it here just to give you guys different ideas because I think this helps people learn too when you start to you know get creative with this stuff but yeah so how are some of the ways that people get around yeah so there are what's interesting about the U.S. is that, that every state has different types of if you form um, a corporation in in some states there it gives you additional privacy that you may not get in other states so the one of the things that is that is like the Nevada Corp, right? So people may want to invest in uh, or create a, a corporation in a, a place where it's hard to get details on who owns the actual structure. And so if you were to, to use a Nevada Corp as a Canadian, you move money into there, then you buy whatever asset you want with the Nevada Corp. That's somebody who's probably trying to avoid taxes now we're not giving anybody advice i feel like i'm doing something wrong right by right kind of <laughs> this helps us understand like what are some of the pros and cons between different these states so correct me if i'm wrong but i think wyoming's similar whether you have that an yeah. anonymity where like you put it in the llc and you have this anonymity but to me that anonymity is kind of stupid because any halfway decent lawyer can figure out what it is and subpoena what's in it but in this case we're going off the thread that countries are clunky and dumb they can't really do that unless they have a reason to uncloak the, the entity. So we're saying, we're not saying this, but what people do is like they throw into the Nevada thing to kind of cloak it. And then it, if you can't see it, you can't tax it. But I don't know, here in America, you're supposed to self, self, self do your taxes, right? In your, in the best way that you can and what's right based on your understanding of the tax. To me, this is a little shady, right? This is yeah, what it, coming down to. Yeah, and, that, and uh, that's why I, I stay out of that sort of stuff. I've got an ITIN number. I file a U.S. tax return as part of what I need to do. And I file my, take my U.S. taxes, take it to my accountant and make sure that it's filed in Canada too. So I, that's... Just to be clear, that is not me. I'm not doing that at yeah, all. No magician tricks here. Nope, and I, this no. LLC, this, yeah. And I buy that. I think that's, I'm aggressive, but to hide it behind something, knowing it's there, that's, um, to me, that's not. No, and you're just inviting to, to get into more trouble for something else. Like I, I just, you don't want people to just keep looking at everything that you do just for something like a, a small portfolio and 
or wherever else you are. You just, I think that you have to weigh the risks when you do something like that. It just doesn't make sense to me. And I think that there are lots of different ways to structure yourself properly. And you just need to find a, an accountant and a lawyer who are familiar with both the U.S. side and the Canadian side at the same time and get their advice. Because there are... Like I've heard of structures where there's a Canadian corporation that owns an S corp in the U S and then the S corp is what purchases properties. There's lots of different ways to do it. What you're trying to do is avoid double taxation. That's as a Canadian, that's what I'm trying to avoid. I don't mind paying taxes, but I only want to pay it once. I don't want to pay taxes like you know two countries taxes on the same dollar. It doesn't make sense. And then what's the point at all? And that's, that's all that I'm, I'm really trying to do. And, and then the other piece for me, hedging against what I'm doing in Canada and the U.S. and, and then having that diversity of a currency as, a, as something that, that I find appealing to me. So when I'm diversifying in an asset class, I understand, but not necessarily in a whole bunch of other. Yeah. Yeah. Going back to the whole, the, the other nefarious type of entity structure, but you see the hard thing is like passive investors out there. You don't know who to believe, right? Everybody's shapeshifters out there. And a lot of lawyers who haven't built up their firms yet are, are young and hungry. What they'll do is they'll put their whole business on this kind of aggressive strategy and they'll run around and say, hey, I got this magic trick where we hide all your assets in Nevada and there you don't pay taxes. What do you do? Go tell all your friends. And yeah, they're professionally licensed and everything, but they're handing their hat on something that's a trick. And in my opinion, not really the right way to do things. So it's hard for people, right? And this is where I keep coming through. You can't just trust what a licensed professional. This is where you have to build your network with other pure passive investors, hear all the different pros and cons of different options, understand it yourself and be, become the architect. But then of course, go to the right professional through referral that you deem the right strategy and to go and implement it. Just like taxes, right? There's guys like the same thing. There's all these different strategies out there. Some, in my opinion, are very nefarious and aren't right. I think you as investors need to take ownership over that. Yeah, absolutely. And like I, what I do is I'm always looking for peers who are either at the same level of me, but, or just above where I am and talk to them about how they do their structures and what they're doing. Not necessarily the, like, I'll ask different professionals about like how they would structure it, but in, then I go, I'm going to go that extra step and talk to other people that I know who are already doing what I want to do and talk to them about how they've got it structured and, and not just one person, two or three people that are doing the same sort of thing to be able to figure this out and then make a decision based on that and what you get from the, the professional. Because in the end, like you're paying somebody and when you pay somebody, there's going to be some bias there, no matter what you do. And they're going to want your business. So you have to make an educated uh, opinion. And I like my, I'm always trying to hang out in a room where the, I'm not really the smartest person in the room. And I don't want to sound egotistical or anything, but I think I'm pretty bright and I've got some experience. So I need to find like rooms that have those type of people and I've joined different like coaching and like I've, I was part of strategic coach and I'm part of the entrepreneur organization, which I really enjoy. And in that group, there are real estate investors from across Canada and I'm able to be in a room with them and like they are they make me look small and that makes me feel good because I feel like I'm learning all the time. So find that room. And they don't have to be like 20 years in front of you. Even if it's just a year or two in front of you, that's probably the best thing, especially if you're just getting started because it's easier for them to want to share with you. If you're going to ask me questions, I don't mind talking to you, Lane, but if I get a new person who's starting investing, ask me a bunch of questions, I'm going to go say, go talk to your lawyer or go talk to your... Like, why are you talking to me? Read, a, not, read the basic primer book on this stuff, guys. Like, like why are you bothering me? So at, at the same time, though, if you had somebody who just went through the process, they're going to want to share that knowledge with you because they're like, they're proud about going through it. I did it last year. Great. Then that's the person that you, that you need to find. Groups like yours, like your, your tribe, right? Like that's the type of thing that will help people get from where they are to the next step because they're interacting with other people who have already done it. And that's what you want to do. And I think this is where you get in the right groups and people pay it for they help out here's exactly what i'm doing to quinton right now picking his brain on this canadian thing and we'll get to my selfish question here at the end 
but he helps me out because he knows that the person that he's helping, if they're the right person, will reciprocate. And not only is it the right thing to do, he enjoys it. This is when you get into these types of worlds, these masterminds, like these are the, the magical things that happen. But so here's my, uh, my selfish question, Quentin, and because you're a little bit further along the road as I am, and I, I just kind of like to, I respect your opinion, not saying I would follow it, but getting these different opinions from people on the same level or important. So it's a question about diversification. So if I understand it right, you and I are in different situations. You're in Canada coming to the US. I'm US, maybe going elsewhere. Canada, maybe one of them for diversification from a real estate standpoint or maybe a currency standpoint. I don't know what side of the fence I'm on at this point. But so if I understand what you're doing, most of your stuff is in Canada. You take a little small chunk in, in US. Is this just a play money fund for you or is this like a true hedge or because you, you, you have no intention of really domiciling this money back to Canada I mean, you don't need it. You don't need the, the money to survive and put food on the table. So what is like the, I mean, is, or is this a, something, a, a hobby? Give me some insight. That's hard. That, that's a hard question for me. I would say that for me, there's a couple of different things. It's again, moving to that investor side rather than the business owner side. You're right. It's not a lot of funds for me to be able to put it in and, and invest in different projects. But it's also, I think I don't intend to bring the funds back, but I, I do like the idea of being in the U.S. for you know quite a few months of the year particularly as I get older. So I'm thinking that it probably would be good to have all of these things set up. I'm a planner, so I, I tend to think 10 years down the road and getting all of these things set up will set me and my family up in the future for the things that I intend to do in the U.S. in the future. There's a, there's a little bit of that. There's a lot of just being able to have U.S. dollars for different things that I'd like to do. And, and it, you're right, it's not a lot of my net worth that's going uh, in there, but it's, it's, it's enough that I think will be useful for me, for my, my future goals and plans. Yeah. Yeah. So it's not like, you're not like a prepper kind of mentality then. By no means and you're not thinking the canadian dollars no and, and i've had many people ask about investing with me in canada and from the us and i'm like why would you do that it doesn't make any sense for make sense for me because the state of california is the population of canada right come on it, instead of coming to canada just go to a different state got so many different opportunities in, in the U.S. Instead of going to Florida, go to Arizona or go to Texas. You've got a lot more of that. We have some of that in Canada with provinces, but the population is so small. If you were to, I, if I were to say, if someone were to ask me that, I would say hedge against different asset classes in the U.S. Do like storage. Or do something else, mobile homes, or do do something else that if you're comfortable in the real estate space, there are other ways that you can do that in there. But you don't necessarily have to, to go out. And, and like, there, there's so many different types of investments out there that you can do that are, I feel like better than putting money in the stock market. Like you can, like if you can do private placements in companies, that's another way to do it, especially if you understand who they are and what they do. That's something you could do, but come to Canada. I'm not going to say, I'm not going to tell you to do it. It, it would serve me well, but uh, like to, to have investors invest my projects, but I'm okay. I think for what I'm, I would suggest for Canadians to definitely to, to consider it and to, to do it. And to do it properly and structure it correctly and stay outside of do it. Uh, don't do the illegal stuff. <laughs> like just do it right, but but don't worry about. I say as a, an American come, investing in Canada, I don't think that's as as necessary. You can do what what you need to do from a diversity perspective in, in different states. Two two common mistakes that come to mind that new investors do all the time is they they think that the grass is greener on the other side. They're in the U.S., but they think that Canada is the untouched proverb opportunity. And then the secondly, like shiny object syndrome, right? A lot of investors get this. They're, they they start to open up into this world of alternative investing and then becomes like a Las Vegas buffet. They're going after the Asian food, the, the seafood, the dessert, the Italian food, which is uh, multifamily, self-storage, mobile home parks. And then they want to go off to Canada too. I always tell people to just focus on one thing, residential, multifamily. I think it's the kind of the start or the basis of it all. But I think people spread themselves too thin and they don't even earn anything. 
spend at least a couple of years into one asset class first and learn that before you even branch off to something else. Because the biggest thing is investing with the right people that aren't going to steal your money. It oh. doesn't matter what asset class you're. Yeah, for sure. And, yeah. and you got to figure out what your goals are too. So some people like... When I first started, I, I needed to replace my income. That's what I, I needed to do to leave my 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 teaching job. And by 2012, I had enough funds to be able to do that. I didn't leave my job until 2014. And then I just kept building and building that one type of like residential real estate where I was getting cash flow from it until I like I did really well with that. I had really solid cash flow coming from that. And then I moved away from that into multifamily because multifamily is not as great on the cash flow at the beginning, but it's great for your net worth. So it was more of a net worth play, stabilize the asset, get the the property refinanced and into longer term financing. Then we started to get cash flow from those assets. But it takes three to five years at least. You can get a home run maybe once in a while that you can do it in one or two years, but mostly it's three to five years. And once you do that, then you start to get the cash flow that comes to that. But people have to first figure out like what their goal is, right? Is it cash flow or net worth? Because some people don't want to quit their jobs. They don't want to to do that and they don't then they need to just focus on okay let's not go to the buffet let's find out where, where the ribs are okay let's find the ribs i'm a meditarian so i don't know yeah myself <laughs> included when i go to the buffet it's just it's lot it's uh, crab legs and it's that of uh, the bone marrow that's all i eat yeah I, i'm big on the i'm big on ribs so that, that that's where i go but you gotta find what that that is and then get enough of that so that it, it's substantial and then you can worry about the the dessert and the salad and the whatever <laughs> yeah go have your pizza then and then your your noodles that's just enough yeah. yeah you just gotta build that up first and then and you're right the shiny object syndrome is a problem like i i see so many different people that have been really successful in real estate only to sell it too early and then get into something else. The analogy that I use is a hockey stick. Well, I'm Canadian. I got to use a hockey stick, right? So you got the you got the base of the shaft. That, you get the base of the stick where you hit the puck and then it goes up, right? The shaft of the stick. What ends up happening is most people actually sell their property probably just a little bit up on the shaft of the stick and they miss the full shaft right? Because of whatever reason, they got distracted. Oh, this is going to be the next big thing. I got to sell this. I got to get into this. And, and they miss all of that. And I think that you got to watch out for that shiny object syndrome. So you can get that big lift that happens with, with the properties over time. And that comes with mortgage pay down. It comes with appreciation and it comes with cash flow and value add repositioning those assets. You can take, even if you can take a single family home, and get it to its highest and best use. Maybe that, maybe get get it to the place where that could be like a triplex or a fourplex by rezoning, doing whatever you can do. You can make that thing make you money. There's no tomorrow if that's what you want it to do. So like you got to figure out what your goals are, but don't don't get distracted and then sell that asset, especially if it's just some tenant that's causing you whatever pro problem it is. You get too emotionally attached, and that's why you sell it. You can't do that. Don't let it, don't let somebody else affect the the reason why you sell an asset. You know, that's it's not a good thing. That means you just got to hire the right people. You got to find out who the who is that's going to help you to manage that asset better and take yourself out of the thinking process because then you're you get too you're too emotionally involved. And then you'll sell it right there at the bottom of the shaft rather than at the top. So we want to close up here. Um, all right. So you're a Canadian citizen. You don't have the protections of the SEC. What if something bad happened in a deal and then your the, the general partners you decided to invest with across the, the country line border goes haywire? What would you do? As an elder. So I would make sure I have the address of the GP's home. I'd find my get in my truck and get my baseball bat and say hello. No, you know what? I think that the thing is that you, you can do as much due diligence as you can, but it depends on like a lot of the things that you see, you, you can foresee coming especially if you're not getting numbers from somebody. Having experience in this business is really helpful. But there are some things that happen that we have no control of. We get a hurricane or there's a you know, flood or whatever it is. But the thing is, did that person have the right insurance in place? Did the people have? And as an LP, you can ask a GP that sort of stuff. 
right? That's what you should be doing. You've got to advocate for yourself. And hopefully if you're with a group of people together who are uh, in an LP, you get that, you get the ability to be able to move that GP forward a little bit just by asking the right questions and staying on top of it. But as a Canadian investing, I have less protection uh, than, than somebody else. But the, you got to remember too, it's just, it's not just me in that as an LP. I got all these other guys who are sec protected. And you know what they're going to do? They're going to complain more than me. Yeah, like a class action lawsuit where you're usually going to have, get... you're going to have that one guy out of the LP of 20 guys or even 150 guys. There's always going to be a leader that emerges. I call it like the Lord of the Fly. There's always one guy that's going to take command of the mutiny and charge things ahead, hire the lawyer. It's just the nature of these people in these deals. They may or may not know what the heck is happening, but there'll be a leader that usually arises. And this is why I enjoy being an LP sometimes, because I've seen this happen a couple of times where a deal has go, gone sidewards. And I'm a GP, so I know what's happening. I'm not, I'm a GP, so I know, I'm not a GP of this kind of, this deal, but I know what the GPs are going through, but I see it from what the LPs are doing. And sometimes it can be overboard and too much and real annoying. And that would really upset me if I was a GP. This is, I think, what happens. And I think this is what it's nice to invest in a group like that, that maybe you are the person that is, I don't care. There's somebody else that probably cares more you that's going to carry the, the baseball bat uh, metaphor. Is. That's right. It was all metaphorical. I'm, that's what I'm saying. But yeah, but the, the other piece there too is that this really isn't a significant amount of my net worth as well. For some people that it may be, but like it, it's not really a significant amount. Saying that I, I wouldn't be upset if I lost it, but I'm not going to eat tomorrow because of it. Like it's not, and that's traditionally the type of investors I like to work with anyways. Like I'm an ideal investor for myself because I know that I, I don't like to invest with people who are bringing 50K or 75K. Like I'm usually looking for people to bring 200K or 250K to, to any project that I do because I'm dealing with a different person. I, I don't like to see people take money from lines of credit and invest with me. I'm looking for other types of people. Like my last, the last couple buildings I had, my last building I had 700K one person brought uh, to, and then I've got a 16 unit where I have 900K that one person brought. I would rather deal with those people and be in a partnership with them, a 50-50 partnership, and get the get the deal done rather than have 10 or 20 people with 50K each. I just find that the people who have 50K are usually the biggest pains. Take the guy's 25 grand because he needs it more than the other guy. No, last, the, yeah. the worst is the last 20, 20 grand. The person with the last 20 grand, I've, I do not, I, I turn many people away from investing in my projects because I just, I'm at a point in my investing career where I would rather not deal with pain in the, um, right. And, and, you know. and this is why I tell people like, if somebody's willing to take 50 grand or less, they're desperate for cash for their project. Yeah, because if sure. not, they would just pull it out of their own pocket because most general partners, their net worth is well over five, ten million dollars. And they'll just feel it personally if yeah. and take a guy's 30 grand. Yeah, it, it's a little sketchy. You want to be careful with, with those type of deals for sure. Great insights. I, I read between the lines with your little US, you're not going to be domicile. I see it. I don't know if you've thought about it this way in your head, but I, I see it. I think I see you doing it as like envelope system. People budget and they have like their little play money fund. I feel like you're using your US money as your play money to when you go on vacation outside of Canada, you just you feel like you can just blow it all. Maybe just don't tell your oh, wife I'm, that. I'm neither <laughs> confirming nor denying what you're yeah. saying. It seems whimsical, but this is, I think, what people in Endgame do. And I think this is what kind of keeps it fun. Just bigger envelopes. And I love learning, right? For me, this is new learning. The US for me is new learning. It was almost like starting from scratch again, like investing directly and going through the process and, and I enjoy it. So I like to continue to learn. I'm going to keep doing this till I can't anymore. This has been a fun conversation. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Folks, once you guys get Quentin's book, the title is Action Real Estate Investor investing planner yeah, the action takers real estate investing planner it's on uh, amazon yeah and last name d s o u z a 
it'll probably pop up to the top of Amazon. We'll pick it up. But yeah, thanks for coming on, Quentin. No problem. And one thing too is they can reach out to me on Instagram at QmanREI. That's my uh, Instagram handle. I'm trying to get my, my followers up on there. So that'd yeah. be cool. There you go. Consolidate your channels, right? I can only focus on one. I'm not really that good at multitasking on uh, multiple social media things. Thanks everybody for joining us and we'll see you guys next time. This website offers very general information concerning real estate for investment purposes. Every investor situation is unique. Always seek the services of licensed third-party appraisers and inspectors to verify the value and condition of any property you intend to purchase. Use the services of professional title and escrow companies and licensed tax, investment, and or legal advisor before relying on any information contained herein. Information is not guaranteed as in every investment there is risk. The content found here is just my opinion and things change and I reserve the right to change my mind. Above all else, do your own analysis and think for yourself because in the end, you are the only person who is going to look out for your best interests.